Chapter 2 It was called the Callius Sajlilu, the city of glowing crystal of Burchest, and it had been one of the most spectacular wonders of the galaxy since the earliest days of the Old Republic. The entire city was nothing more or less than a single gigantic crystal, created over the eons by saltile spray from the dark red-orange waters of the Lithari Sea that roiled up against the low bluff upon which it rested. The original city had been painstakingly sculpted from the crystal over decades by local Burchestian artisans, whose descendants continued to guide and nurture its slow growth. At the height of the Old Republic, Callias had been a major tourist attraction, its populace making a comfortable living from the millions of beings who flocked to the stunning beauty of the city and its surroundings. But the chaos of the Clone Wars and the subsequent rise of the Empire had taken a severe toll on such idle amusements and Callius had been forced to turn to other means for its support. Fortunately, the tourist trade had left a legacy of well-established trade routes between Burchest and most of the galaxy's major systems. The obvious solution was for the Burchestians to pr promote Callius as a trade center, and while the city was hardly to the level yet of Sfivrin or Ketaris, they had achieved a modest degree of success. The only problem was that it was a trade center on the imperial side of the line. A squad of stormtroopers strode down the crowded street, their white armor taking on a colored tinge from the angular red-orange buildings around them. Taking a long step out of their way, Luke Skywalker pulled his hood a bit closer around his face. He could sense no particular alertness from the squad, but this deep into Imperial space there was no reason to take chances. The stormtroopers strode past without so much as a glance in his direction, and with a quiet sigh of relief, Luke returned his attention to his contemplation of the city. Between the stormtroopers, the Imperial fleet crewers on layover between flights, and the smugglers poking around hoping to pick up jobs, the darkly businesslike sense of the city was in strange and pointed contrast to its serene beauty. And somewhere in all that serene beauty was something far more dangerous than mere Imperial stormtroopers. A group of clones or so New Republic intelligence thought. Painstakingly sifting through thousands of intercepted Imperial communiques, they tentatively pinpointed Callius and the Burgess system as one of the transfer points in the new flood of human duplicates beginning to man the ships and troop carriers of Grand Admiral Thrawn's war machine. That flood had to be stopped, and quickly, which meant finding the location of the cloning tanks and destroying them which first meant backtracking the traffic pattern from a known transfer point, which first meant confirming that clones were indeed coming through Callius. A group of men dressed in the dull buns and robes as Fiverni trainers came around a corner two blocks ahead, and as he had so many times in the past two days, Luke reached out towards them with the force. One quick check was all it took. The traders did not have the strange aura he detected in the boarding party of clones that had attacked them aboard the katana. But even as he withdrew his consciousness, something else caught Luke's attention. Something he had almost missed amid the torrent of human and alien thoughts and sensations that swirled together around him, like bits of colored glass in a sandstorm. A coolly calculating mind, one which Luke felt certain he'd encountered before, but couldn't quite identify through the haze of mental noise between them. And the owner of that mind was, in turn, fully aware of Luke's presence in Callius, and was watching him. Luke grimaced. Alone in enemy territory, with his transport two kilometers away at the Callius landing field, and his only weapon a lightsaber that would identify him the minute he drew it from its tunic, but he was not exactly holding the high ground here. But he had the force, and he knew his follower was there. All in all, it gave him fair odds. A couple of meters to his left was the entrance to the long, arched tunnel of a pedestrian bridgeway. Turning down it, Luke stepped up his pace, trying to remember from his study of the city maps exactly where this particular bridge went. Across the city's icy river, he decided, and up towards the taller and higher class regions overlooking the sea itself. Behind him, he sensed his pursuer follow him into the bridgeway, and as Luke put distance between himself and the mental din of the crowded market regions behind him, he was finally able to identify the man. 
It was not as bad as he'd feared, but potentially, at least, it was bad enough. With a sigh, Luke stopped and waited. The bridgeway, with its gentle curve hiding both ends from view, was as good a place as any for a confrontation. His pursuer came to the last part of the curve. Then, as if anticipating that his quarry would be waiting there, he stopped just out of sight. Lucas sended his senses, caught the sound of a blaster being drawn. It's all right, he called softly. We're alone. Come on out. There was a brief hesitation, and Luke caught the momentary flicker of surprise. And then, Talon Card stepped into sight. I see the universe hasn't run out of ways to surprise me, the smuggler commented, inclining his head to Luke in an abbreviated bow as he slid his blaster back into its holster. From the way you were acting, I thought you were probably a spy from the New Republic. But I have to admit, you're the last person I would have expected them to send. Luke eyed him, trying hard to read the sense of the man. The last time he'd seen Card, just after the battle for the Katana, the other had emphasized that he and his smuggling group intended to remain neutral in this war. And what were you going to do after you knew for sure? I hadn't planned on turning you in, if that's what you mean, Card said, throwing a glance behind him down the bridgeway. If it's all the same to you, I'd like to move on. Verchestians don't normally hold extended conversations in bridgeways, and the tunnel can carry voices a surprising distance. And if there were an ambush waiting for him at the other end of the bridgeway? But if there were, Luke would know before they reached it. Fine with me, he said, stepping to the side and gesturing card forward. The other favored him with a sardonic smile. You don't trust me, do you, he said, brushing past Luke and heading down the bridgeway. Must be Han's influence, Luke said apologetically, falling into step beside him. His, or yours, or maybe Mara's. He caught the shift in Card's sense, a quick flash of concern that was as quickly buried again. Speaking of Mara, how is she? Nearly recovered, Luke assured him. The medics tell me that repairing that kind of light neural damage isn't difficult, just time-consuming. Card nodded, his eyes on the tunnel ahead. I appreciate you taking care of her, he said, almost grudgingly. Our own medical facilities wouldn't have been up to the task. Luke waved the thanks away. It was the least we could do after the help you gave us at the Katana. Perhaps. They reached the end of the bridgeway and stepped out into a street considerably less crowded than the one they'd left. Above and ahead of them, the three intricately carved government headquarter towers that faced the sea could be seen above the nearby buildings. Reaching out with a force, Luke did a quick reading of the people passing by. Nothing. You heading anywhere in particular? he asked Card. The other shook his head. Wandering the city, he said casually. You? The same, Luke said, trying to match the other's tone. And hoping to see a familiar face or two, or three, or four, or five. Sicard knew, or had guessed, why he was here. Somehow that didn't really surprise him. If they're here to be seen, I'll find them, he said. I don't suppose you have any information I could use. I might, Card said. Do you have enough money to pay for it? Knowing your prices, probably not, Luke said. But I could set you up a credit line when I get back. If you get back, Card countered. Considering how many Imperial troops there are between you and safe territory, you're not what I would call a good investment risk at the moment. Luke cocked an eyebrow at him. As opposed to a smuggler at the top of the Empire's locate and detain list, he asked pointedly. Card smiled. As it happens, Callius is one of the few places in Imperial space where I'm perfectly safe. The Brachestian government, Governor and I have known each other for several years. More to the point, there are certain items important to him which only I can supply. Military items? I'm not part of your war, Skywalker, Card reminded him coolly. I'm neutral, and I intend to stay that way. I thought I'd made that clear to you and your sister when we last parted company. Oh, it was clear enough, Luke agreed. 
I just thought that events of the past month might have changed your mind. Card's expression didn't change, but Luke could detect the almost unwilling shift in his sense. I don't particularly like the idea of Grand Admiral Thrawn having access to a cloning facility, he conceded. It has the long-term potential for shifting the balance of power in his favor, and that's something neither of us wants to see happen. But I think your side is rather overreacting to the situation. I don't know how you can call it overreacting, Luke said. The Empire has most of the 200 dreadnoughts of the Katana fleet, and now they've got an unlimited supply of clones to crew them with. Unlimited is hardly the word I would use, Card said. Clones can only be grown so quickly if you want them mentally stable enough to trust with your warships. One year minimum per clone, as I recall the old rule of thumb. A group of five Vac-3 passed by in front of them along a cross street. So far, the Empire had been only cloning humans, but Luke checked them out anyway. Again, nothing. A year per clone, you say? At the absolute minimum, Card said. The pre-Clone Wars documents I've seen suggest three to five years would be a more appropriate period. Quicker than the standard human growth cycle, certainly, but hardly any reason for panic. Luke looked up at the carved towers, their sunlit red-orange in sharp contrast to the billowing white clouds rolling in from the sea behind them. What would you say if I told you the clones who attacked us on the katana were grown in less than a year? Card shrugged. That depends on how much less. The full cycle was 15 to 20 days. Card stopped short. What? he demanded, turning to stare at Luke. 15 to 20 days, Luke repeated, stopping beside him. For a long moment, Card locked eyes with him. Then, slowly, he turned away and began walking again. That's impossible, he said. There must be an error. I can get you copies of the studies. Card nodded thoughtfully, his eyes focused on nothing in particular. At least that explains Yukio. Yukio? Luke frowned. Card glanced at him. That's right. You've probably been out of touch for a while. Two days ago, the Imperials launched a multiple attack on targets in the Abrion and Dulfian sectors. They severely damaged the military base adored Padrone and captured the Yukio system. Luke felt a hollow sensation of his stomach. Yukio was one of the top five producers of foodstuffs in the entire New Republic. The repercussions for Abrion Sector alone. How badly was Yukio damaged? Apparently not at all, Card said. My sources tell me it was taken with its shields and ground and space weaponry intact. The hollow feeling got a little bigger. I thought that was impossible to do. A knack for doing the impossible was one of the things Grand Admirals were selected for, Card said dryly. Details of the attack are still sketchy. It'll be interesting to see how he pulled it off. So Thrawn had the Katana Dreadnoughts, and he had clones to man them with, and now he had the ability to provide food for those clones. This isn't just the setup to another series of raids, Luke said slowly. The Empire's getting ready to launch a major offensive. It does begin to look that way, Card agreed. Offhand, I'd say you have your work cut out for you. Luke studied him. Card's voice and face were as calm as ever, but the sense behind them wasn't nearly so certain anymore. And none of this changes your mind, he prompted the other. I'm not joining you the New Republic, Skywalker, Card said, shaking his head. For many reasons. Not the least being that I don't entirely trust certain elements in your government. I think failure has been pretty well discredited. I wasn't referring only to failure, Card cut him off. You know as well as I do how fond the Mon Calamari have always been of smugglers. Now that Admiral Akbar has been reinstated to his Council and Supreme Commander positions, all of us in the trade are going to have to start watching over our shoulders again. Oh, come on, Luke snorted. You don't think Akbar is going to have time to worry about smugglers, do you? Card smiled wryly. Not really, but I'm not willing to risk my life on it either. Stalemate. All right, then, Luke said. 
let's put it on a strictly business level. We need to know the Empire's movements and intentions, which is prob something you probably keep track of anyway. Can we buy that information from you? Card considered. That might be possible, he said ca uh, cautiously. But only if I have the final say on what I pass on to you. I won't have you turning my group into an unofficial arm of New Republic intelligence. Agreed, Luke said. It was less than he might have hoped for, but it was better than nothing. I'll set up a credit line for you as soon as I get back. Perhaps we should start with a straight information trade, Card said, looking around at the crystalline buildings. Tell me what started your people looking at Callius. I'll do better than that, Luke said. The distant touch on his mind was faint but unmistakable. How about if I confirm the clones are here? Where? Card asked sharply. Somewhere that way, Luke said, pointing ahead and slightly to the right. Half a kilometer away, maybe. It's hard to tell. Inside one of the towers, Card decided. Nice and secure and well hidden from prying eyes. Wonder if there's any way to get inside for a look. Wait a minute. They're moving, Luke said, frowning as he tried to hang on to the contact. Heading almost towards us, but not quite. Probably being taken to the landing field, Card said. He glanced around, pointed to their right. They'll probably use Marvel Street, two blocks that direction. Balancing speed with the need to remain inconspicuous, they covered the distance in three minutes. They'll probably use a cargo carrier or light transport, Card said, as they found a spot where they could watch the street without being run over by the pedestrian traffic along the edges of the vehicle way. Anything obviously military would attract attention. Luke nodded. Marvel, he remembered from the maps, was one of the handful of streets in Callias that had been carved large enough for vehicles to use, with the result that the traffic was running pretty much forward to aft. I wish I had some macro binoculars with me, he commented. Trust me, you're conspicuous enough as it is, Card countered, as he craned his neck over the passing crowds. Any sign of them? They're definitely coming this way, Luke told him. He reached out with the Force, trying to sort out the clone sense from the sandstorm of other thoughts and minds surrounding him. I'd guess twenty to thirty of them. A cargo carrier, then, Card decided. There's one coming now, just behind that trashed speeder truck. I see it. Luke took a deep breath, calling on every bit of his Jedi skill. That's them, he murmured, a shiver running up his back. All right, Card said, his voice grim. Watch closely. They might have left one or more of the ventilation panels open. The cargo carrier made its way towards them on its repulsor lifts, coming abruptly to a halt a short block away as the driver of the speeder truck in front of it suddenly woke up to the fact that he'd reached his turn. Gingerly, the truck eased around the corner, blocking the whole traffic flow behind it. Wait here, Card said, and dived into the stream of pedestrians heading that direction. Luke kept his eyes sweeping the area, alert for any sense that he or Card had been seen and recognized. If this whole setup was some kind of elaborate trap for off-world spies, now would be the obvious time to spring it. The truck finally finished its turn, and the cargo carrier lumbered on. It passed Luke and continued down the street, disappearing within a few seconds around one of the red-orange buildings. Stepping back into the side street behind him, Luke waited, and a minute later, Card had returned. Two of the vents were open but I couldn't see enough to be sure, he told Luke, breathing heavily. You? Luke shook his head. I couldn't see anything either, but it was them. I'm sure of it. For a moment, Card studied his face. Then he gave a curt nod. All right. What now? I'm going to see if I can get my ship off planet ahead of them, Luke said. If I can track their hyperspace vector, maybe we can figure out where they go from here. He lifted his eyebrows. Though, two ships working together could do a better track. Card smiled slightly. You'll forgive me if I decline the offer, he said. 
Flying in tandem with a new Republic agent is not exactly what I would call maintaining neutrality. He glanced over Luke's shoulder at the street behind him. At any rate, I think I'd prefer to try backtracking them from here. See if I can identify their point of origin. Sounds good, Luke nodded. I'd better get over to the landing field and get my ship prepped. I'll be in touch, Card promised. Make sure that credit line is a generous one. Standing at the uppermost window of Central Government Tower No. 1, Governor Staffa lowered his macro binoculars with a satisfied snort. That was him, all right, Fingal, he said to the little man hovering at his side. No doubt about it. Luke Skywalker himself. Do you suppose he saw the special transport, Fingal asked, fingering his own macro binoculars nervously. Well, of course he saw it, Staffa growled. You think he was hanging around Marvel Street for his health? I only thought... Don't think, Finkel, Staffa cut him off. You aren't properly equipped for it. He sauntered to his desk, dropped the macro binoculars into a drawer, and pulled up Grand Admiral Thrawn's directive on his data pad. It was a rather bizarre directive in his private and strictly confidential opinion, more peculiar even than these mysterious troop transfers the Imperial High Command had been running through Kellius of late but one had no choice under the circumstances but to assume Thrawn knew what he was doing. At any rate, it was on his own head, not Staffa's, if he didn't, and that was the important thing. I want you to send a message to the Imperial Star Destroyer Chimera, he told Finkel, lowering his bulk carefully into his chair and pushing the data pad across the desk. Code this per the instructions here. Inform Grand Admiral Thrawn that Skywalker has been on Callius and that I have personally observed him near the special transport. Also, as per the Grand Admiral's directive, he has been allowed to leave Burchest unhindered. Yes, Governor, Fingal said, making notes on his own data pad. If the little man saw anything unusual about letting a rebel spy walk freely through Imperial territory, he wasn't showing it. What about the other man, Governor? the one who was with Skywalker down there. Staffa pursed his lips. The price on Talon Card's head was up to nearly 50000 now. A great deal of money, even for a man with a planetary governor's salary and perks. He had always known that someday it would be in his best interest to terminate the quiet business relationship he had with Card. Perhaps that time had finally come. No. No, not while war still raged through the galaxy. Later, perhaps, when victory was near and private supply lines could be made more reliable. But not now. The other man is of no importance, he told Finkel. A special agent I sent to help smoke the rebel spy into the open. Forget him. Go on. Get that message coded and sent. Yes, sir, Finkel nodded, stepping towards the door. The panel slid open, and for just a second, as Fingal stepped through, Staffa thought he saw an odd glint in the, in the little man's eye. Some strange trick of the outer office light, of course. Next to his unbending loyalty for his governor, Fingal's most prominent and endearing attribute was his equally unbending lack of imagination. Taking a deep breath, putting Fingal and rebel spies and even grand admirals out of his mind, Staffa leaned back in his chair and began to consider how he would use the shipment that Card's people were even now unloading at the landing field. That's the end of the chapter. Hope you enjoyed it. Talk to you soon.